I already moved, you know, I told you. <laughs> okay. So uh, this session, um, we, we, we like to have a session every, every uh, time from Andreas because he always gives a really good talk. And um, this one is um, talking in more detail about NMOS 08. You might not have heard a lot about that yet, but uh, once we're done today, you'll know all about it. So um, I'm very confident. Andreas, uh, take it away. All right. Thank you, Wes. Um, thank you for showing up here in the IP Showcase Theater and taking your time to uh, attend these presentations. I know some familiar faces and some faces I haven't seen before, so I hope the next 25 minutes uh, will be as educative uh, as well, maybe a little bit of entertainment uh, as well. So let's take it off from here. I'm giving you a basic introduction on 2110 with focus on audio transport and the uh, audio routing um, task which we face when we are transporting audio streams, uh, which is then leading into IS08, which addresses these kind of uh, tasks we are facing when transporting and connecting audio. So first of all, my name is Andreas Hildebrandt. I'm working uh, as um, Ravenna technology evangelist for ALC Networks out of Munich in Germany. So we apparently invented the uh, Ravenna AOIP technology, which is an open license-free technology available to all interested uh, manufacturers. And the good thing is uh, Ravenna is already fully compliant with AA67. That's why we call it a system built in. And it also complies to the ST2110 suite of standards. So that was the advertising section of it. Now back to the uh, topic. As you all know, SEMTI 2110 is a professional media of our managed IP networks, and it basically defines mechanisms to transport the elementary essence signals into uh, individual streams or with individual streams across a network. And the main ingredients are something like the timing, which is defined by SEMTI 2059. That's about the PTP stuff how video is being transported. This is in, uh, related to a well-standing RFC. Audio is uh, defined just the same way as it is in AES 67 and Ravenna. And then the ancillary data, which is the part of the data which is usually stored in the vertical and horizontal blanking um, intervals of SDI. There is another RFC uh, which has been taken up for SEMTI 2110. Just give you a diagram and illustration of this, as a, again, as an introduction to 2110. If we have an SDI signal that usually contains video and certainly data audio, an ST2110 sender would now take the individual essences and put them as individual streams on the network. So any receiver interested in uh, getting uh, the essence data can subscribe to these streams and recompile the original signal because all the synchronization information is inherently contained in the network related to the precision time protocol, to the timing, um, to the common time reference. Now, you know, talking SDI into the network and SDI out wouldn't make any sense for 2110, or put it the other way around, you wouldn't need 2110 to do this, right? We could have used 2022-6 already for this, to transport this in IP. The benefit of 2110 comes into game once we look at a typical live production situation where we want to do some audio processing. Um, typically, an audio processor would nowadays with SDI have to get the SDI signal, de-embed the audio, do the processing, and re-embed into an SDI signal. Now, with 2110, the audio processor or audio device can just subscribe to the audio essence signals and does not care about the video essence at all. So it can subscribe to the audio essence, do the processing, and put another process streams or output uh, into the system. And it's not, of course, not just for receiving, it's also for getting feeding signals into the system. A camera can just um, um, insert the video and the ancillary data streams into the network and uh, any number of audio devices just take care of the audio signals. So all these different essence signals are living inside the network and through the clever transport mechanism of multicast, interested devices can subscribe to whatever essence they need and the synchronization is taken care of by the overall common clock reference distributed by PTP. Quick look into the document structure because we are now turning into the audio side of things. We have the dash 10 document talking about the system timing and general definitions. We have the dash 20 document which describes how the active video, the video part of SDI without the ancillary data, is being uh, 
uh, formatted and transported across the network. With this high load of data and uncompressed SDI signal comes with, we need some sort of traffic shaping on the network in order not to overload any subsequent uh, switch or receiver buffers. This is being defined in the uh, dash 20 document. We have the dash 30 document, which describes how PCM, linear audio, is being transported. Basically, that's what's contained in the AES 67. Um, there's the dash 31. It's the newest published document, I guess, um, which talks about the AES 3 audio transparent transport. You know, PCM audio is just a 24-bit linear audio signal. But in some cases, for production, we also need the full AES 3 signal with the accompanying AES metadata bits, or because we want to transport something like Dolby E, which requires the full AES signal capacity. So that dash 31. And finally, dash 40 is the transport, formatting and transport of the SDI ancillary data. Now, we are looking at um, audio. Of course, a more, lot, lot more documents are in the works right now. We are looking at the audio side of things. For audio, we need to look at the dash 10 document, because that's applicable to all type of data. The dash 30 document, which transports linear digital audio, and dash 31. So let's uh, focus on the linear PCM audio for a moment. Dash 10 and dash 30 are the documents you want to go with. And basically, it says in dash 30, well, use AES67, because AES67 already is a very clever format. Everything we need is defined there. So let's use AES67. Dash 30 says, well, we want to use AES67. Quick detour to AES67, hands up. Who has never heard about AES67? Who is not aware of AES67? Everybody? Wonderful. So I can shorten this. AES67 is a well-maintained standard. The, far, uh, the last uh, maintenance uh, release was in 2018. Um, the initial publication was in 2013, so it's a well-established, uh, very good standing standard. And the idea of AES67 actually was interoperability. We didn't want to define a new AOIP technology or mechanism. We wanted to encourage the manufacturers of existing technologies to adopt this interoperability scheme to make it possible to interchange audio signals on IP without having to go through MADI or any other analog or digital um, signal transport means. So we have all these nice uh, solutions, which you, most of them you probably have heard about. And because they are all of, uh, although they are all based on IP, they couldn't talk to each other. Except Ravenna and Livewire, they agreed on a scheme back in 2012 already to interoperate. And well, for the others, we had to wait for AS67 being defined and adopted. And AS67 is the layer on top which did not replace a Livewire, a Dante, a Qlan, a Ravenna definition or technology. It's just a definition of things which needed to be implemented in order being able to exchange the data natively on IP without having to go through the audio layer. So that's AES67. There's a number of technology components which I will show you very briefly. I won't explain them in detail because there are other presentations for that. But if you look at these components, you can easily identify if you're already a bit into 2110. All of this somehow is also in 2110. So basically, the lineup of AES67 definitions it's the very same lineup, what is in the dash 10 document of 2110. So we have synchronization, we need to talk about media clocks, the transport, QoS, quality of service, the encoding, the format which is finally transported, how a stream is described and how streams are connected. And AS67 came up with a set of mandatory requirements which have to be fulfilled or used in order to be AS67 compliant. I'm not going to explain this because, as I said, completely different uh, explanation uh, uh, presentation here. Discovery uh, is another function of a fully-fledged uh, technology. This has deliberately been taken out of the definition because there are so many different discovery uh, schemes available that we thought it's not wise to force people to adopt one particular scheme. And basically, the SEMT people followed along the very same lines. You wouldn't find any discovery in SEMT 2110 either. Okay, back to SEMT 2110. So now we say dash 30 is AS67, isn't it? Well, not quite. We have some constraints in here. Um, are these constraints harmful? Do they break the interoperability? Do they have new requirements which are not fulfilled by AES devices? Short answer is no. There are some particularities, and these are well described in a white paper published by the AIMS. 
It's called AES67 ST2110 Commonalities and Constraints. It's freely available for download on the AIMS website. And that explains in detail what constraints have to be met by AES67 devices in order to be fully 2110-30 compliant. I can tell you from a practical point of view, every AES67 device out there can be made working nicely in a 2110-30 environment. Take that for now. If you want to know more the details, look at the white paper or talk to the experts uh, uh, in the room. Now, that was linear audio. As I said earlier, in some situations, we want to transport the full AES-3 signal. And um, yeah, we need to add something because AES-67 is only taking care of linear 24-bit PCM signals. So with AES-3, we can basically transport anything which can be, uh, well, it's defined for AES-3 like uh, linear PCM with the AES data bits, but also non-PCM audio formats. Actually, we can even transport non-audio formats at all with AES3. Uh, in order to facilitate that, we needed to ex and enhance the payload section, the payload definition, and guess what? Uh, the Ravenna definition already contained this from the very beginning. So we had a format which is called AM824, which was part of the original Ravenna definition from the very definition from the very beginning, um, and basically it retains all the definitions for AS67. Only one thing changes: we add another byte of payload to the three bytes we would need to transport 24 bits. So we have the original 24 bits of the AS67 payload plus a clever arrangement of the PCUV bits, which are defined in AS3. Um, also, the signaling needed, uh, needed to have an addition because uh, the receiver needed to know, is that AES67 PCM or is it AES3? So in the signaling side of things, in the STP file, we have another format identifier, which is called AMA24. And uh, basically, all other uh, STP parameters are the same. And um, SAMTI had a look at the uh, Ravenna AMA24 definition, and since it's a apparently a um, uh, well-founded definition, and it was being in use already. They said, okay, it makes all sense what's in here, it's being in use, so let's just put it into dash 31. So they took the definitions, uh, did, a f did their own format, uh, word formatting and, and wording as well, and so the dash 31 uh, document basically reflects what is in the Ravenna AMH 24 definition. And now, I was mentioning the other use of AES3, the metadata transport. And actually, for those of you who are interested in metadata for immersive sound productions, we have a technology demo on the Ravenna booth, which is uh, right outside of Hall A, just the hallway uh, down there, which describes how to, uh, Dash 31 streams can be utilized in a uh, Dolby metadata authoring context side by side with the standard AS67 streams, actually two of them, containing nine channels of audio the uh, real-time rendering data being sent to a rendering device and then processed according to the metadata and the rendering um, uh, application or the rendering situation uh, on the uh, final end. So if you're interested in this kind of things, uh, please come over and have a look. It's not a product demonstration. It's just a pure technology demonstration in order to demonstrate how this uh, can be done, how this is be uh, achieved. All right. So. We have the transport of the audio, right? We can transport audio signals on uh, IP. We have the AS3, we have the linear uh, audio. What else is required for a system? Quite a lot, I would say. Um, at least establishing connections, right? I mean, we have streams on a network, nice, but how to connect to these streams? Um, this is not covered by 2110, neither it's covered by AS67. So we need something else. Luckily enough, Emma was jumping in or jumping on this topic, identified that this is a vital, essential functionality which is needed to build systems. And so they um, defined uh, what uh, they called NMOS. Um, NMOS is the um, um, network media open specification. That's basically a set of specifications which address required functionality above the pure transport and synchronization. Um, and um, some of these specifications which are required for audio connection management and routing inside the devices is uh, what I'm talking uh, in the remaining 10 to 15 minutes. 
Other specifications are out there, which can be seen on the back of the walls. Uh, please talk to the expert if you're interested uh, in those. So relevant uh, specifications for the audio transport and connection management. ISO 4, discovery and registration. We need to know what's available in the system. What streams, what senders, what receivers, what are their capabilities. Otherwise, we can't do any connection at all. We have uh, an API for actually making connections, so telling devices, please connect to that particular existing stream over there. And finally, we have an API now which can tell devices, okay, once you have connected to that stream, how do you want to route the channels which are in that stream to your existing uh, available outputs? You know, if you subscribe to an eight-channel stream but have 64 outputs available on your device, you need to tell the device, okay, which channels have to go where. And this is covered by ISO 8. So let's go in here stepwise to understand how this works. Anmos um, carries at first some key elements, and they are basically, oh, that was the wrong order, they are basically called identity. So in order to know what's on the network and how to know uh, how to work with these uh, um, elements, any element in such a system can nicely be identified by a unique uh, identifier. So sources, senders, flows, receivers, even devices, they have unique IDs. And these are uh, uh, announced or made known uh, into the registry. So that's where ISO 4 comes into game, the registry, uh, registration and discovery, uh, which finally should ensure that parts of the system know each other and can work with each other. So we have our device with all these single entities, single uh, objects inside the device. And of course, we, we don't have one device. We have a network and a bunch of devices connected to the network. But we also have control systems being connected to the network. And now what happens is a device utilizing ISO 4 announces its entities, its objects, into a registry. The registry is not a piece of hardware. It's a service, somewhere accessible or available in the network. It can run on a switch, it can be a different server machine, whatever. It's a service, a registry service. So all the devices tell the registry, okay, I have this and this and this and this is available, these are my capabilities. And any of these objects have unique IDs. So they are stored in a registry. Now, a broadcast control system can query the registry and can always get the information what is available on the network and what's the status, let's say, of a flow or a receiving point, is it connected or not, is the flow running, whatever. All these things are reported into the registry and can be queried by the registry. That's ISO 4, discovery, registration. Now ISO 5 kicks in, make simple connections, connecting streams from senders to receiving points. Um, again, we have a node or two nodes or multiple nodes. For now, we'll just look at two nodes. Um, we have an application logic, which is some sort of broadcast controller, um, we have the registry, all the devices report their objects into the registry. The broadcast controller, the application logic can query the registry, so that's ISO 4. And now the application logic, by knowing, okay, there's a sender object which can create a certain type of stream, there's a receiver object which can accept a certain type of stream connection, can tell through an API the sender to actually provide stream information, tell the receiver where that stream information can be, uh, can be acquired or can even push the stream information into the receiver API. And by then evaluating the data, the SDP data, the receiver exactly knows what to do in order to subscribe to the particular stream. And then the stream is flowing from the sender to the receiver. Since we are talking about multicast in most cases, this is a mechanism which is called IGMP on a network which subscribes to uh, multicast streams. Now, the good thing of this uh, uh, NMOS uh, definition is it's independent of any particular format or stream protocol. Of course, the logic needs to know, okay, this receiver can receive video streams, and this is a video stream which is on offer. You can't connect a video stream to an audio receiving point, but this is all part of the ISO4 uh, identification um, uh, functionality. So this is the simple way on how a, an existing stream or a stream can be set up and generated, activated, and how that stream can be connected to an, an existing capable endpoint. Simple stream mechanism, uh, connection management. So now the challenge, the next step, the challenge is, let's have an example. Let's say we have a 5.1 surround setup. 
These are all audio receivers. Remember, we are talking about audio, right? Uh, and we have a device which can send out six channels of audio. So now, how do we actually distribute these channels and connect them to the individual uh, speakers? Well, what we could do, of course, well, we know the physical setup. There's a switch, and all the devices are independently connected to the switch, right? That's the physical network setup. Easy. So how do I actually know and how can I distribute the signals to the individual network nodes? Well, one thing, of course, is I can instantiate six individual unicast streams and tell the device to send them off as individual streams to the desired destinations by uh, advising them, uh, by giving them the unicast destination address. So that's certainly option one. Six independent streams with one, channels in each with one channel in each stream. One option. That's the most native option you would think of. You will have six uh, you know, cables running from the, from the amp to the uh, speakers. Well, that is not uh, the most um, optimized way. It's not very efficient because we are setting up six independent streams. We are using six times stream overhead, six times connection management, all these kind of things. Luckily enough, network technology offers us the multicast um, streaming. So we can generate just one stream out of the box, putting six channels into it, forward it to the switch, tell the devices they all should subscribe to the very same stream. The switch is taking care of duplicating the packets. Nice, nice uh, work by the IT industry, actually. And um, so every device gets that six-channel stream. And now that poses another question, of course. How does the device know, if I'm looking at a particular device, how does that device know which screen actually it should connect, which channel it actually should connect to? Well, apparently the um, subwoofer should connect to the LFE channel, but how does it know? And that's now where ISO 8 kicks in. You know, the connection is done with ISO 5, routing the six channel stream to the individual speakers. And now ISO 8 is mapping, gives you the ability to map single channels to particular available outputs. So here's the, um, the object model for ISO 8. We have a device which has, you know, some inputs, some outputs, or some sources of things, like the IT guys uh, would say. Um, and now the model of ISO 8 covers a input stage, which in, a particular, in this particular example has two-channel capability. It has an output stage, which has another two-channel capacity. I mean, this could be different numbers now, just for, for explaining the model behind uh, ISO 8. And then it has a matrix, a patch field which is also accessible and defined within ISO 8. That's the base model. And what I can do now through ISO 8, I can tell uh, the input stage to connect, um, uh, the, 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 yeah, the input stage uh, to patch relevant channels into the output stage where discrete uh, output um, connectors might be uh, sitting and waiting for data. So that's the basic model of ISO 8. And um, the interaction um, uh, or the overall scheme, how it works, uh, seen together with ISO Fave, is illustrated in the upcoming in this upcoming illustration. We have a sending device. We have a source. In this case, a stereo flow, a stereo stream, or a stereo signal, left channel and right channel. So the sender within ISO 8 has a channel one and channel uh, two input. This is a one-to-one -one, uh, matching. Now that stream is being offered. We have a receiver on the other side, which has the receiving connecting point but then is forwarding this because this is defined as a two-channel receiver capability or two-channel receiver point. And then we have the ISO 8 model um, where now with ISO 5 can simply make the stream connection. That doesn't yet tell us where to route the individual channels to or which channels to take. And now ISO 8 as the next stage kicks in and says, okay, um, these two channels from that input, I only want to have the first channel and route that to my channel one output as an example. So we have a two-stage process here, ISO 5 for connecting the stream to a matching connecting point within that node, and then taking it on further, you know, uh, disassembling the stream into channels and making patch points depending on the uh, capabilities and availability uh, of the particular device announced through ISO 8. So um, I don't want to go through code examples. Uh, for those of you who are code savvy, you can look into this on GitHub and see how easy the, this is defined where all these model parts, uh, where they can be found uh, in the code. Um, 
Here's just a, a flow diagram of what actually happens. Let's say we have a receiver, a sender, um, and the, uh, the client, which is the broadcast controller, actually ISO 5 would at first make sure that the stream connection is happening by pushing the SDP information into the receiver, uh, the receiver then initiating the connection. That's where ISO 5 stops, the stream is flowing, and then ISO 8 kicks in, and um, the uh, client is telling the receiver, um, uh, first of all, it's, it's querying the receiver capabilities, and then it's telling the receiver how to patch the incoming uh, single channels of that particular stream to its available output stages. Uh, just to flow the out diagram here. Um, if we look at a more complex example, and that's the final uh, illustration I have here, um, this is a typical IP SDI gateway. You can see on the top we have the SDI input. That video signal is being taken from the IP uh, signal, uh, from the SDI signal, and a video sender, so that's the dash 20 sender now, is generating a stream, which in turn is then connected to the video part of an IP receiver, so it's receiving the dash 20 stream. Then we have a number of audio channels which are de-embedded inside the sender. It's formatted into two independent eight channel streams because eight channels are the uh, mandatory requirement uh, to be met by AS67. Of course, we could have built a 16 channel or 64 channel stream as well. Um, and these streams in this example are sent over and connected to those receiving points. You can see the, this IP gateway on the other side has four potential receiving points. So ISO 5 is taking care through the broadcast controller to where that exactly is being connected. And as you can see already, the ISO 8 stage coming here is then telling the device which channels actually to take out of that stream and connect to which points. And as you can see, it's not just, you know, doing a linear connection, a diagonal connection matrix like this. It's in this example, it's only taking the first two channels, leaving out a number of channels, uh, continuing onwards from channel nine. And the reason is why in this example, there's also a nice um, um, uh, yeah, a example on how to deal with a non-PCM data. Uh, in this case, it's a Dolby E example. So the original um, audio contained a Dolby E track which is another stream being transported, dash 31, put into a receiver, connected internally to the Dolby E encoder of a totally different device, which then decodes the individual, the, the individual uh, <laughs> channels there and sends off another dash 30 streams containing the Dolby E decoded audio channels, which are now connected to another receiving point. And as you can see in the matrix right here, these channels are being used for the output signals because those are patched to the outputs instead of the uh, original channels contained uh, in the original stream channels 2 to, to 8. Just, a, just an example. I mean, there can be multiple uh, variations in here. But that's the way how ISO 4, discovery of capabilities, ISO 5, stream connection, and ISO 8, signal patching work within the NMAS uh, functionality. Um, I think that's it. Um, yeah, more information said on GitHub. And um, I would say at this point, thank you for your attention. F two minutes over, as always. Um, of course. I guess, <laughs> thanks. But, but that's, that's <laughs> fine, uh, Andreas. Um, real quick, do we have uh, any questions from the audience? Anybody want to um, dive into anything in uh, more detail? Um, if not, I recommend that you, uh, you know, get this man's uh, email address. There you go, Ravenna. And um, just as a reminder, all of these uh, presentations will be um, available on the uh, VSF YouTube website, vsf.tv. Also, our website will have a pointer to that. Um, if you scanned your badge at the way on your way in, you'll uh, get a link to the uh, presentations once they're posted. And again, any questions? Okay, thank you very much, Andreas. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.